Hello there, Shakers. Welcome to another episode of Mind Shack Podcast. This podcast has been developing and growing beyond our expectations. We would really love to thank you. That's all. And we hope you enjoy today's video. Hello, hello. Greetings, Dumelang Jambo. My name is Jean Claude Guaze, aka JC. Welcome to season four of the Mind Shack Podcast. We're a Gen Z podcast that focuses on discussing societal issues, entrepreneurial leadership, culture, and borders on topics in psychology for Africans. All we do is shake out the cobwebs on social issues we see in the world today. We do it the African way, the young African way. So in this episode, we're talking about Africa, which boasts one of the world's highest entrepreneurship and female entrepreneurship rates. While entrepreneurial potential is high, the contribution to economic growth has been limited. The big question here is why? So Mind Shakers, this is episode seven. This is titled, What Do African Entrepreneurs Actually Do? So in order for this conversation to be a little more fruitful than myself, who normally does his homework, um, we have someone joining, a guest that I think is very fitting for this topic, has quite a lot of experience and will touch on some pretty, um, hopefully interesting points from their stories and experience. This guest is a trade and investment executive dedicated to increasing the connectivity between African markets and other regions of the world. Having grown up a Canadian citizen, his passion, his passion led him to spend most of his working life across Africa. He began in community development, then pivoted to entrepreneurship and established a couple of companies, including like a logistic, logistics company that moved to FMCGs. Um, this is a man that's just, you know, he's kind of just had a lot of time and experience in the entrepreneurial space within the African context. Right now he's based in Toronto, Canada, and is the founder of Eshton Solutions Limited. That's a boutique firm that promotes sustainable trade and investment in African markets. So with that said, our guest today is Tafuma Musere. Tafuma Musere, I, I, I'm pretty sure I've done justice to your full name there because I'm also from Zim. <laughs> But I'm going to give you this opportunity to just tell us how you're doing, give you this opportunity to tell us also why you decided to join us today. Thank you so much, Jean-Claude, for having me. Uh, it's really a pleasure to have this conversation with you. And uh, when you reached out, I was quite interested, especially because I like the approach you take. Um, you know, you talk about this being a Gen Z podcast. And, and I like the fact that you're speaking to your generation and I have an opportunity uh, to to be a part of that. So thank you for having me. So pleasure, with, that, with that, I think it's a good time to start with some of our key questions within our discussion. We're talking around entrepreneurship. Mm -hmm. We're talking around better understanding the space in the African context, which we believe you have quite a bit of experience in. Um, I spoke about Asherton Solutions. I firstly kind of want, want you to talk us through that, talk us through some of the work you're doing there. Eschaton Solutions, and it's, a lot of people get the pronunciation wrong, it's Eschaton, um, and uh, it denotes a decisive time to act. That's what Eschaton refers to. And it's basically based on the idea that now is a decisive time for Africa to take its seat at the global table, essentially. And so it was a company I started four years ago when I first came back to Canada and realized that there was such a lack of engagement with African markets. So through that, I really got to get my hands dirty in terms of trade facilitation, um, also investment uh, facilitation. So originating deals and playing an advisory role to investors. And uh, so that is still there. It's kind of phased out a little bit now. You know, I have a few other priorities, but it's still there. And we still service a couple of clients at the moment um, and, you know, some, some rather complex projects, I would say that come my way, sometimes I get an opportunity to do it through Eschaton. Okay, awesome. So what, what would you say right now is your key passion within the space of entrepreneurship? So, um, so again, it's still really around connecting African markets to other markets, as you mentioned um, at the beginning. And so I have an organization I started called AfriFursa, and that exists to highlight opportunities for equitable exchange with African markets. So we just did a fintech summit, for instance, and um, connected Canadian and various African ecosystem players together. So that's one thing. And then also in entrepreneurship is actually my role in a private equity firm. 
Um, so I, I also wear an investor hat. And that's very entrepreneurial driven because we're dealing with entrepreneurs all the time. You know, we have value creation. So we got to think about how to impact these companies that we are, are investing in, in a way that helps them do better. Okay, awesome. That's really awesome work you're doing there. I, um, I think for anyone that's listening to this, getting, you know, getting down to looking at some of the website information and that type of stuff will provide you some key insights and understanding of important work that has to do with connecting Africans, which I would assume a lot of the listeners are passionate about and enjoy hearing about. So definitely mm-hmm. encourage you on listening there. Afri Fursa and Eskaton Solutions and some of the work he's done. Um, uh, another key question, now we're kind of getting into the topic media. So according to African Development Bank, 22% of Africa's working age population um, is starting businesses. So can you talk and define entrepreneurship and self-employment, your understanding of those two terms and what, what the differences might be? Sure. So I think typically the way that people try and make a distinction between self-employment and entrepreneurship is self-employment being freelancing, you know, or just kind of gigging, you know, like the gig economy. Whereas entrepreneurship, people look at where you're starting a company where you'll employ others, there'll be more than one employee. Um, However, I think that distinction is somewhat artificial because in order to basically um, to, 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 to either be a freelancer or to start an enterprise, you still have to take an entrepreneurial um, risk and direction. So if you define entrepreneurship as taking some kind of risk um, in order to gain financially, both parties are doing it. It's just in a different context and one can lead to the other. You can actually start trying to build a team and realize, you know what, this is, this is too much or this is not addressing the need and shrink down. Or you can start small and say, you know what, I need to hire more people. Um, so I think it's really about seeing the opportunity and seizing it. Okay. Um, a question that kind of bodes off, you know, it's like a question with a hidden, with a couple of hidden areas that could potentially be touched on. Um, like we've seen entrepreneurship is growing rapidly in Africa and entrepreneurs continue to face domestic challenges that are existing in the context of Africa, whether it's some of the regulatory systems and many others there's a there's there's a list you could dabble down any any standard african could probably dabble down a couple lists of uh, issues within their countries that exist so a question question here and touching in that area not directly tied but touching in that area do you think entrepreneurship is key for africa's development and how do you think it could be key for africa's development that's a good question jean claude and i would say that it is extremely key for africa's development for a few fundamental reasons. I mean, Africa has the highest birth rate in the world, highest fertility rate. So as, as many of us now know, the population is due to double by 2050. So we're at 1.3 billion, you know, so we're looking at what, 2.6 by 2050. So we're gonna have the largest workforce in the world. And, and, and that's even, I think by 2035. So the thing is that can the jobs that are being created keep pace? with the people that are entering, the millions that are entering the workforce um, every year, you know? Uh, did I say 1.3 billion? I think, I hope I did, because it's, it's billion um, in terms of the overall population. But yeah, so millions are entering the workforce, you know, and because jobs cannot keep up with that, you have to have the ability, you have to foster the ability for people to create their own jobs. And we also know that there are many industries or sectors that are still very nascent in Africa. And there's a lot of room for growth in them. At the same time, we're pushing boundaries, we're innovating. And that's a key thing about entrepreneurs. Entrepreneurs drive innovation and they drive employment because most, um, you know, most people who are employed on the continent are employed by uh, a small or micro, um, small or medium enterprise. And I want to touch a little bit on, you know, equality around gender inclusivity and things of that nature, female entrepreneurship and its potential impact on the continent. It's a, it's a big and broad question, but like, I definitely want to hear your insights there and what's happening. Maybe you're seeing some of the trends, trends within the context, what, what is happening within there? I think, I think uh, part of the question will be good 
it would be good for you to touch on um, like uh, failure rates as well to businesses, touching on some like challenges and stuff like that that exist. Um, gender being the first one and important one, you, your insights on that. Um, I, I also want to start off the question by answering it myself. So allow me to ask a question to myself. I feel, I feel like um, internal, internal, there are internal factors and external factors that are affecting the African context, um, be it regardless of gender, into external, internal factors potentially being skills that exist, whether skills that, that exist, you know, education tied to skills that exist being actually effective within the entrepreneurial space and posing low impact within that, you know, tied to social impact and real problems that exist. I feel like that's a challenge that exists and one that Africa needs solutions to get over as well as potentially um, within that, you know, there's a lot of things that build off it that could be like poor staff training, development of uh, individuals that work for um, companies or just a misunderstanding of the problem and customers and things of that nature how to be forefront and impactful in that sense, bring real value. I feel like Africans tend to tie challenges to their to their individualism and you know there's a lot of this like me make ends meet sort of work to it instead of um me helping someone else within the same context that now touches on like external factors that then exist once you have people that are actually impactful in the space external factors would be like um the regulatory systems that exist whether the the doing business context and environment that's created by african governments is actually helpful that's the way I would think around these challenges and how potentially you can start to then see solutions and things of that nature. And then, you know, in the African female entrepreneurial space, um, that's, that's, that for me boils back down to education. Education again. And I'm, I'm helping start the conversation because I don't really have the answer to this one. But I feel like it boils back down to education and how there's a lot of exclusivity for the women based on culture, based on existing norms that Africans practice. The woman has a has a role, a defined role, you know, and that role for uh, tied to culture is very difficult to for Africans to see outside of and creates a lot of limiting factors that have been long term and currently exist. So yeah, with that context, the question is looking at some of the challenges that exist, now tying it to the female entrepreneurial space, what do you believe, why do you believe that is so? Well, why do you think some of these factors exist? And then maybe you can talk on potential direction, solution that you could see Africa going towards. I mean, you covered a lot there, Sean <laughs> Claude. And, um, I, you know, I think you hit on a lot of things that are really critical, you know. And so when, when you look at, you're talking about, you know, you're talking about entrepreneurs just thinking for themselves. The thing about entrepreneurship um, is that it has to answer real questions. You know, there's, there's this whole proverb around answering questions that nobody is asking. And that's, that's what you get when you don't have good product market fit. So it's, I actually believe that solving your local problem first is really the right way to go. Because you, you understand your, your local environment, your ecosystem. You should understand it very well. So if you look at Impesa, they were solving a very local problem, you know, in terms of the exchange of, of money. And, and mobile money has taken off not only across Africa, but across the world. Uh, but at the same time, 50% of mobile money, um, you know, accounts are sitting in Africa. So it's, it was such a hyper local problem that had the ability to scale. And not every solution will have that, but I think that's okay. I think it makes sense to solve solutions locally. Now, you know, because of some of the issues you've mentioned, like regulatory, you know, access to finance, education. So, you know, you talked about some of the issues around regulation and education, and those are very systemic issues, you know, and, and I agree that those are things that need to change, um, including cultural issues around how women are viewed. But at the same time, if you look at some of our cultures, you know, some are matriarchal, you know, some of them, it's the mother's family, you know, I'm from Zim, and uh, as you are too, and you know that, that mothers and women like our tetes play a very important role, you know, 
Um, and even if you look at some of the culture around Muzukurus and the role that they play in terms of serving your family through the, the mother's kind of lineage, you know, I still think that, or if you look at some Ghanaian cultures where it's the mothers, I think, I think even last names come from sometimes from the mother's line, but women play a very strong role. So, um, and I think that's why you find in some places that, you know, that we are actually ahead of the game compared to other regions when it comes to female representation, like in government, for instance, compared to other developing economies and, and regions. And, um, and so, yeah, there is a lot of work that has to be done around encouraging female participation because it creates a more robust, you know, ecosystem when you have women participating. Women, there's research that's coming out that is saying that women are actually better investors than men, typically, um, and better, you know, better at saving. And, uh, and I remember hearing somewhere that something like, uh, you know, the, the, the amount that a woman, um, especially, let's say, a mother, will get from $10 versus what a man from that family or father would get is multiples different where the woman will get a lot more. Um, and, you know, and I think we've probably all seen how, how our mothers have been so resourceful, you know, and have uh, typically done the best they can to, to raise us. And that's a very personal way of seeing it um, and not to domesticate them or anything like this, but to say that we have seen that um, and, and it's important. So we've, we've seen how mothers play a key role and our sisters and, and so on and how enterprising um, just gender they are as well. And they, they need to have the opportunity to participate in the entrepreneurship and business ecosystem as well. This is a thank you to you, a mind shaker, a listener of this episode. We highly, highly appreciate you joining in on all of these episodes. If you can just take a second to share this link to someone to have them tap into these episodes, that will be so highly appreciated. You are the fuel to what we're doing here. So please share the link. Please like, please comment, please subscribe or follow in whichever platform you're in. And we will see you on the next episode as you continue to fuel us through. Thank you. The conversation we have coming up. At this point, we're going to get into our episode game. So, our episode game for today. Uh, loyal listeners of Mindshakers might have heard this game before or, or heard us play this game before. This one's called Never Have I Ever. So, we're going to ask six, six, six questions. A simple six questions. We're going to allow you to get a little yeah. bit vulnerable yet to pull my if you shall. Have a little fun with us. But the first question I'm going to ask is never. Mm. Also, before I get into it, before I get into it, you're very mm. familiar with Never Ever Ever, right? Not really, but just from the title of the game, it's, uh, I'm getting an idea. Maybe you can okay. explain it to me. How the whole never, thing never. works. Never Ever consists of me saying a statement and then you yeah. basically confirm whether that's been something that you've gone through in your experience. Okay, so just yes or no? You can say yes or no and then I might ask you to build on it. Ideally, no, let's let's build on all of them. We've got six questions. Let's build on all six questions. If you say yes or no, you just tell us a little bit of a story around it. So okay. first things first, never have I ever wanted to switch career. So this is, so let me make sure I've answered the question right. So what I'm saying is, yes, I have wanted to switch careers yeah. uh, at times. Yeah, I think the road um, in entrepreneurship is really, really challenging, um, especially because you start by seeing something that usually nobody else or perhaps a few people are seeing, especially if you're starting something new, if you're a pioneer, you know, if you're a fast follower, that's different. Um, but if you're a bit of a pioneer, uh, even being a fast follower, I think any type of entrepreneurship where you're really breaking ground, you know, doing something new, uh, there, there's a lot of downs, a lot of valley experiences. You know, you're tilling the soil, so to speak, and you will hopefully see the fruit um, at some point in the future, but it's usually not immediate. So there have been many times I've questioned myself in terms of what I'm doing. Okay, which, which makes sense. If you were the opposite of that question, I'll be, I'll probably have a couple more questions. In most cases, at some point, you know, I don't know anyone that's figured it out to 15 or 16 or 17, and that's the direction they go for the next 40 or 50 years. I think everyone dabbles in a couple of areas that formulate their opinions of certain things that are attached to what is their passion, why, what direction they'll go and what the next 
10 years and 15 years of their life looks like. So good start there. And also very easy question, let's be honest. <laughs> oh, that was easy? Oh. Okay. Um, I'm pretty sure you're being sarcastic. The second question, <laughs> never have I ever regretted making a purchase. No. Um, so yeah, I've, I've definitely regretted making purchases. Yeah. Let's hear your uh, worst purchase. I, I don't know if this was actually a purchase, but I think it was. Um, there was a time where I was doing some business development for a chemicals company when I was in South Africa. And um, I had set up some great meetings, you know, with some top decision makers at some firms that were going to take this product, this particular product, um, only to find that when it came to bringing the product to them, that it was the wrong color, it was the wrong consistency. It was just the wrong thing. Uh, even though the company, which I was doing the business development on behalf of, and I think I had taken ownership of that stock, so I had purchased it. Uh, you know, at a reduced price, you know, had said, this is what it's for. But uh, I remember after that, trying to get a follow-up meeting after realizing, oh, okay, so we need to do this. Okay, I'll take it back to the company. And I just got the secretary who basically was like, yeah, when they're ready, they'll come back to you. <laughs> that just, that sticks out of my mind. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so I'm assuming, I'm assuming they didn't come back to you. That was a burnt bridge. That was a burnt bridge. And that was a tough lesson in business, actually. Yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, there we go. Getting a little deeper with the questions. Um, third question, little fun one. Never have I ever broken a bone? Yes, that's true. I've never broken a bone. I'm very active, like, uh, you know, but I'm not, I'm not, so I, would, I wouldn't really call myself a sports person. I'm into the martial arts. And it was a couple of years ago, I was playing basketball. I was in another country altogether. And um, I was actually traveling for an MBA that I was doing. And I think okay. it was the last day of classes, which was really, really fortunate. Mm. Um, me and a couple of guys who probably had no business running around shooting on the court. It was a really hot place too. Um, in between classes, I got out there and I think it was, yeah, I, I, I was jumping a lot, you know. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, I'd love to say that I was like, you know, slam dunking and, you know, all kinds of stuff, but nothing like that was happening. It's probably just a little layup, layup or something like that. And um, yeah, and I, and I landed and felt something back in my leg and I thought someone actually like, you know, kicked me or run into me in the back of my leg. And I was looking around, I was asking everybody, I was like, did you run into me? Like, you know what happened? And then I basically realized that I couldn't put any pressure on that, on that foot, on my left foot. Mm -hmm. And I, and as soon as it happened, I realized, you know, as soon as I looked at it, I realized what happened. And a bunch of my friends who are also my age, who I used to play ball with when I was younger, talked about torn ACLs and all kinds of stuff, you know. And I made a mental note that basketball is dangerous the older you get if you haven't been playing it consistently and, and all that, um, just because of the change of, you know, direction and all that. So, uh, yeah, it was quite unfortunate. And, um, yeah, that's what happened. Yeah. Yeah, I've read it's kind of like breaking a bone. Like your Achilles tendon is really, really, really tough to get through. Yeah. How, how long did the recovery yeah. take? Oh, man, the recovery was, so I was in a cast for about, uh, I think it was two months. And yeah, uh, yeah two or three months. And then mm. after that, yeah, um, I, you know, I had, I still had my, um, my crutches. And then I was supposed to move to a cane. I kind of refused to do that. And um it was probably all told about eight or nine months before I could actually walk unassisted. Okay. Um, all right. Thank you. That's, uh, that's really, you know, you made, you made something out of nothing with an answer in that question. I, I appreciate that. That's a, that's a significant injury. So yeah. we're going to move a little bit quicker. Three questions, right? Last three. Never have I ever hated working with team members. No, that's not true. Um, in one particular organization I worked with another senior person uh was really difficult to work with and uh and we bucked heads all the time mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay nice and simple yeah. and straight i like the mm -hmm. i like the response there last two questions never ever ever gone vegan or vegetarian gone that's people go i would and say yeah <laughs> but, 
People go uh, and come back. I came to learn that recently. <laughs> I, I wouldn't even say I've done that. I mean, I've done a fasting sort of thing, which is, you know, mm. set time, like a week or even 21 days. But I would never say I've gone to that yeah. side. Okay, okay. So certainly a meat lover, huh? I'm a lover of the meat. Okay, I'm with you. Mm -hmm. Last question. Never, ever, ever been awake for two days straight. That's a, that's a, that's a definite uh, no. Um, yeah. Yeah, so I've been awake. I've been awake for two days. Yeah, I've done that. I feel like two days is the minimum. I feel like it was like, it's like a week. <laughs> it's felt like that, but, um, but yeah. Okay. Awesome. Yeah, I think um, towards the end, I can attest to what you're sharing. Uh, mothers play, mothers play a significant role. I don't know, this is an idea. Like, use your own context in order to understand the broader context. <laughs> Um, you, you, the family dynamic tells you a lot about how uh, the broader dynamic is, is uh, impacted because I believe it starts in the home and probably, you know, some of the cultural conversations, you know, filter then into a professional context as a result of some of the things you've mentioned. So, yeah, I think, I think, that's, I think that's well said. I think what, what I want to move into in question is um, on the assumption that there's unproductive entrepreneurship that exists on the continent. Um, now looking at it from a public perspective, government and the impact government has within the regulatory systems, we touched on slightly, should governments subsidize what we might call um, unproductive entrepreneurship, whether it's driven by opportunity or survival, innovation, or generally replication, how should government go about increasing you know, things are on challenges to access to finance. Maybe you can touch on what's, you know, maybe there's a step before that, before that question, you know, like what, what in the first place causes these, um, has caused this access to finance issue. You can speak on that. When you talk about unproductive entrepreneurship, even if we could back it up to there and, you know, why don't you define that for me? What, what would you see as unproductive entrepreneurship? That's a, a good thing I do my homework before I come in here, you know. Um, unproductive entrepreneurship, you could speak on being, for instance, the self-employed um, around some of the factors you spoke about where entrepreneurs are not by definition operating as entrepreneurs. So actually, so the work they're doing is not tied to a problem, a solution that's actually fixing a problem. That's what I would potentially define as unproductive entrepreneurship. Um, I, hope, I hope that's clear. I think it makes a little bit of sense, right? I think that one is a bit of a challenging one for me because um, if, if someone is self-employed, and by the way, most, the majority of, if you look at Africa's, I think it's something like 44 million um, micro, small and medium enterprises, 97% of them are micro enterprises, which means that they have four or less people. And, and in Canada, 54% of all businesses are micro enterprises, you know, and in the black community, it's something like 90% where it's actually an owner operator. So they're just one person businesses. So these are, are the majority of these businesses that are, that are, you know, pushing our economies that are growing our economies, innovation and, and so on. Um, and so, I think the markets will test any enterprise, especially, uh, you know, as a free market, you know? So in the scenario where people can choose what they want to pay for and not, if you don't have something that has value, even if you and I say that's perceived value, that's not real value. Like, you know, there's a whole debate around NFTs and is there real value there, you know? But if people are willing to pay for it, you've got a business. And if they're not willing to pay for it, well, then you'll find yourself out of business. So if you're talking about funding something that is not making money, yes, I would say in that sense, you have to be very careful. At the same time, you have companies like Amazon, which ran at a loss for years before they ever made any kind of profit or like a Tesla, you know, and these are different 
these are different sort of business models. And a lot of people right now on the continent are actually pushing that model. Even some of the names that you and I know um, that have become really big names in, in business uh, are, are not profitable yet but they're getting huge market share and they're growing astronomically. Um, and as a private equity investor, my perspective is that you should really think about making profit from day one and build that into your core business model from day one so that you are taking some value from the company. So, you know, your people are being paid, you're being paid something um, and you're not risking a whole lot of money. So the idea of unproductive entrepreneurship, I would say, you know, just to kind of circle back to that is, yes, in the sense that if it is not a profitable enterprise, especially for a long time, it might not make sense to invest in it. Um, and then the second thing I would say is if it's, if it's predatory in the sense that if it's, you know, if it's abusing consumers, you know, um, if it's dangerous for stakeholders in the business environment, so for instance, you have a lot happening in the crypto space, you know, and you've had some scenarios where you have people who've invested in these cryptos. And then there's a case in South Africa recently where I think these two brothers just disappeared with a whole lot of money that they had also fundraised and so on. Uh, and that kind of thing, we need to stop. But failure is part of entrepreneurship. So if you're saying that, you know, well, because this company, you know, uh, you know, if, if you look at failure as a benchmark to say, you know, we don't want any failure and investing in companies that fail is is bad. Well, yeah, it, it happens, though, you know, and it has to happen in order to refine for an entrepreneur to be refined and to even to refine a business proposition. So. Um, so, yeah, I think it's it's a very it's not as easy as one would like to think. Touched on quite a few important points, but I need to take the side mission. NFTs, <clears throat> cryptocurrency, things of that nature, the next in the, the next revolution. What's what's your take on it for Africa? Particularly, I feel like anything that's along that vein, Africa catches it way down the way, way down the line. Once the big players have taken up all of the bags, <laughs> all of the bags of opportunity. So, what's your take? Well, I think in fintech generally, we're a lot more nimble than most other regions. A lot more nimble, certainly than Canada. And when we did the FinTech Summit, that's what came out, you know, like the payment rails here in Canada are a lot more limited than, for instance, in Ghana. I mean, sorry, across Africa. Um, and I was thinking of a Ghanaian uh, FinTech, actually. Um, or if you look at the, the number of wallets, e-wallets that we have available here versus there, you know, the use of mobile money, you know, is there's so much adoption across the continent, not as, as much adoption here. Um, and even in terms of, so the fact that we don't have as much legacy infrastructure allows us to, um, even in the banking space, you know, kind of leapfrog, you know. So when it comes to, um, you know, for instance, I mean, Nigeria just released a central bank digital currency. Uh, and I think they were the first African central bank to do that, if I'm not mistaken. I mean, we don't have one in Canada yet. There's been a lot of proposals around it and discussions around it too. Um, but I think just the fact that we're mobile first on the continent makes a lot of these things make sense. And I know that even in Zim, people were exploring cryptocurrency because of some of the Forex issues years ago, you know? So um, as my, one of my, my friends uh, who I work with actually put it, you can't stop crypto on the continent. And you can see that even here, you know, the regulators are starting to acknowledge this and the big banking players are starting to put money behind this. It's not going anywhere. It's one of those things where we either, I think, regulate it a bit, you know, and try and, you know, ensure that it's safe for all stakeholders, you know, uh, to participate in it. But, uh, but crypto currencies are, I don't think, going anywhere, or even central bank digital currencies, which are different because they're pegged against, you know, whatever value the central bank has. Um, but yeah, the, those aren't going anywhere. Okay. Okay. I'm with you. Um, I, need to, I need to double back. Can you talk about your experience? Let's talk about your, your experience, your experience navigating the African business context. 
What's your challenges? What, what, what did you see as opportunities? Things of that nature. Your on the ground practical experience and learnings. Well, I would say it's nuances. You know, um, for instance, in logistics, you can come, you know, like for instance, in South Africa, where we were working at the time, started a logistics company there and, uh, you know, hired a driver, bought a truck and all that. And we were, we were playing the game, you know, we were in the industry and we were delivering and we were delivering on time. We were delivering well, but um, for instance, when you blow a tire and you need to change that tire, you need to know where is the cheapest place you can get the best quality. It's, it's really, it's really about that, you know? Um, and in many cases, you might find that your competitors are actually cutting a lot of corners. And that's why sometimes you get these unfortunate accidents, you know? Um, but you, you need to be able to stay afloat and to be successful, uh, to, to play in that game. And, and again, when I say the nuances, it's because of the relationships that people have built in the industries over years they know how to source parts. They know how to source, you know, uh, the, the best contracts and, and they have relationships with uh, some of the depot managers. So they get the best routes, you know, so you can't just come into a, into an industry on the continent and just try and sort of, you know, feel that whatever you've learned, wherever else you're coming from, you can just import it and it's going to work. You need to understand the nuances on the ground um, to, to, to enter an industry, to, to do business on the continent. Okay, so touching on the last question now, um, we're, 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 we're a young group here in Mindcheck and our listeners tend to also be a fairly young group. Um, I think some of our listeners are probably doing some or in positions of potentially starting a new venture or like that big next phase and decision in their life that might be tied to this topic. So how, how about this as a question, how can, African, how can Africans harness mushrooming um, opportunities or like youth startups and use them use them as like leave levers to rebuild some of the communities some of the issues that exist whether you're speaking from a private equity investor perspective or you're speaking from um, an individual's perspective within the entrepreneurial space so the question was about how to build their ecosystems yeah how best how, their communities. yeah how best to how best to build the ecosystems and communities ecosystems you know touching on the existing existing frameworks existing businesses within similar spaces and you know you know just build and drive it i think especially in these times we're living in with you know with covid um firstly anything that is has a social element um, I think that's the future. I think that business shouldn't be just purely commercial. You know, I think you have to think beyond that in turn, and then you have to think about impact. So you have to have specific objectives in terms of, you know, make your money because you need that money to be sustainable and to support your community, you know, but have some goals, have some really important top line impact driven goals, you know, whether you want to, increase gender diversity within your little workforce, you know, within your organization, or even create a product or service which will benefit women just as much as it benefits men. You know, um, for instance, that's the gender diversity. There's also the ethnic diversity. You know, there's, there's even social economic divides that we need to cross, you know? So, um, you know, maybe for you, it's climate, you know, whatever you're passionate about, you know, allow that to be a part of, of your business model. And then I think the other thing I would say is just remember customer, uh, customer centricity really trumps even that sense of purpose. Because if you have a business, because we're talking about business here, we're not talking about nonprofits, you know, or philanthropy. Uh, if you have a business model that is purely purpose driven, but is not making money because it doesn't serve the customer's needs, you know, or it doesn't serve it in the right way or it doesn't speak to them the right way, then you don't have a winning social enterprise or business. So remember to understand your customers, shift away from, you know, me, I think this is the best thing and this is what you need to actually taking 
the incredible knowledge, experience, and background you have, and almost laying that at the feet of your customers, get to know them, ask them what they're looking for, and how you can better serve them. And I think that um, that makes a, a really strong trajectory for, um, for any entrepreneur. Fantastic. That's an awesome way to end. Um, yeah, Tafuma, this was, this was really awesome. Thank you so much for joining. Um, again, to everyone, that's, to everyone that's listening, Tafuma is, you know, a person that's passionate about building networks. Some of the, some, within Africa and some of the key things he's working on around Afri Freza, the FinTech Summit, Eskaton Solutions, some of the, uh, basically just built, built around, built around how to have Africans, you know, stand up, help one another and be more impactful socially. So again, thank you to Fuma. Thank you for joining us. To our mind shakers, thank you as well for listening. This was the episode on what do African entrepreneurs actually do. Please don't forget to follow us on social media and tell us your thoughts on this topic in Africa, in this context, whatever it means to you. Also for our mind shakers, we encourage you to go out there and share anything you might have learned from this episode as we all strive to learn together and boldly shake the world. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's been a pleasure. And thank you so much to your listeners as well. Thank you for listening through to the end. If you've enjoyed this episode, please like and subscribe on your preferred podcast platform or all of them. There's going to be plenty of exciting episodes to come. So if you want to catch that, follow us on all social media platforms at Mindshack Podcast. And of course, follow us or subscribe to us on our YouTube platform or our YouTube channel at Mindshack. And of course, see you on the next one.